I'm Julian DeShazier. I am a pastor out in Chicago on the south side, right on the campus of the University of Chicago at University Church. I've been there close to 10 years now and I'm also a musician and go by Jay Quest and I've been doing that long before I knew church or anything else. And that, that's another thing that's kept me in the streets of Chicago and across the, the country and world as well. Uh, pursuing art and, and sharing that art with the world. And so that's part of who I am. And I'm a Chicagoan lifelong and I've been here and I'm still here now and I love it. The story of how this virus is affecting folks is a large part of the story of Chicago across decades and generations where you're seeing a third of the population is black, but over 70% of the cases are black folks. Um, and so most of the deaths, most of the people in the hospital right now are black and brown people and communities that have already been uh, kept away from resources and, and have had their communities divested from across the generations. And so now when you have something like this happen and those folks are getting hit very, very hard. And it, I think it compounds with issues of, of uh, again, around this notion of the neighbor where these communities uh, of, of my people have not been able to trust government or trust medical systems because we've been used, our bodies have been used to experiment uh, medically or because uh, of the prison pipeline or other policies that have kept us from really trusting those institutions. And so now when folks are coming out and saying, no, this is really serious, it's like, oh, serious, like the last thing, right? Like, and so you're seeing people uh, I think not take it as seriously because of who it's coming from until they see their aunt, their mother, their grandmother get sick. And then it's like, okay, wow, this is real. That's what I'm hearing on the ground and experiencing from a lot of my peers where when it was just a news story for maybe that first month or so, folks were just kind of like, oh, you know, it's like bird flu or something, right? I'm not going to get it. That, that's not going to happen to me. And now we're seeing that it is resting and living within those communities because of the conditions of those communities. And, and so that's, those conditions didn't start with coronavirus. You know, they, they've been ongoing and, and it's the kind of what we call evil that exists within the, uh, the communities. The people are not evil, obviously, but the, the evil systems that uh, have really kept people back. And now it's killing people in an even more literal way, unfortunately. Our church, University Church, is a big time advocacy organization and congregation and city and known for that as well, uh, having our faith right next to justice action and reconciliation work. And so really what COVID has done is caused a lot of those organizations who we partner with uh, to make sure that they're taking care of their people in a very specific way, not just policy kind of, always working on policy, but right now really focusing on making sure that people have enough food to eat, uh, have their medicine, the folks who are the most vulnerable in those communities being able to get things to them, keep them connected to technology and such as well. And so our role as a congregation has been like in any of that other work, just to facilitate that, to help them. When we recognize that, oh, we might have a little bit bit more privilege or access or resources uh, that we can share with others in this moment that we really take seriously the notion of being a neighbor right now and, and doing the work of neighbor and building neighborhood in this moment where everybody is so afraid, but to also be doing the work of asking about, hey, how's the person who lives above me and below me? How are they doing right now? How's that elderly person down the block? Let me just go check up on them real quick or give them a call. And so that notion of neighbor and community and beloved community has really become strong in this moment because it, it now lives in a very tangible way. It feels even more uh, real in this moment with people actually dying and uh, with folks who are seeing their lives be disrupted in some incredible ways, Un you know, folks losing their jobs or or watching people around them get sick. So we're, we're on the ground in the midst of that and, and really working with all of those populations to try to make sure that, one, that they're working together and thinking about each other and not just kind of siloing off. But then whatever we need to do, including and beyond prayer, thoughts and prayers, you know, that like that's what we're about right now. When we come out of this moment, so many people are talking about getting back to normal to recognize that there's no such thing. There is no normal. There will never be a normal again. This is one of those watershed moments. 
like a World War II, like a 9-11, you know, to kind of change the way that we do things and the way that we engage with one another. And hopefully that will help folks on both sides of privilege and access to look at where they rest inside of this world and the system and to ask if that's adequate. And if it's adequate that the folks on the other side are living that way or being more affected by this thing, uh, what are the conditions that create that? And even when, even when we come out of this to recognize that people are still dying in black and brown communities. And so how can we, uh, how can we, whether it's folks of privilege or white folks or, or however you want to think about it, how can we be more a part of, of living life together with people who are being disproportionately affected by life and including the coronavirus. And so I think it's an opportunity for a lot of organizations, congregations to ask this of their people to say, how good are we doing at being in relationship with the people that are most affected by the stuff that we preach about? Uh, whether that's police brutality or poverty or, or public education being really uh, kind of in shambles in some parts of the country and stuff to really ask, like, and not just say, hey, how do I get my kids into private school? Or how do I make sure I'm okay? But how do we make sure every kid on this block has an opportunity to have that education, to have that access, to have that opportunity, whether it's healthcare or anything else? And so what I'm hoping is that what will come out of this moment is our, our leaders asking these questions, not that we've been asking about coronavirus, to, to keep asking the same questions. How can I keep myself safe? How can I take care of others, right? That's like everybody's asking that in a very unselfish, you know, we got all the commercials and everybody's kind of capitalizing on, hey, we're going to work together and, and bring sports back or whatever, right? Like to, to be able to have these same kinds of conversations about, hey, we're going to work together because there are communities where people just do not have the same access and opportunity that I have, that we've had for generations, how can we change that? You know, I want that same kind of, keep that same energy, we say, right? Like keep that same energy when everybody can shake hands and hug again, let's get back with one another and ask the very simple question, like how can I be good neighbors to these folks who are, who are living this life right now? And how can I recognize that it's not like them living this life, but like that's my life too. Like it's not a us and them, yeah. but that we're in this thing together. That's my fear that we'll come out of this and we won't find new language. We won't expand our circle of the we, you know, so that when we say we're okay, like who is the we we're talking about? You know, at a certain point, some of those folks should look like and live different from you and should be a part of your we. And if that's not happening, then our world is too small. And I see it happening now. I saw it happening before coronavirus. And, and, and in so many ways, what COVID does is just accentuate the problems that already exist accentuate the ways in which relationships are fractured already between whether it's people and people or a government and its people. So all of that stuff is coming to light and we have an opportunity to address that. And I hope we'll take it as something that I'm certainly yelling about every time I get a chance. <laughs> this is the work that I'm working on, on on a daily basis, you know, as a pastor, as a, a faith leader, like these are the questions that matter the most to me. So I better have some practical stuff if I'm going to ask people to make these commitments. They got to go live it out too. And, and w whether that's right now, it's been me asking or just saying out loud to folks like, hey, if you've got enough mask, if you've got enough hand sanitizer, the, after you thank God for that, the next question should be, can I help somebody who does not have this? You know, uh, I think it's about whether it's food pantries or folks who have things on the north side, which is, you know, it is as white as the south side is black. You know, that you see that divide really strong when you go from north to south um, or from north to west. And it's just simply asking, hey, if you're on the north side, whether you're an organization or a person and, and you've got access to simply ask for example if, if you've got a box of masks and you say well, we got enough okay well go call some a shelter on the south side now you know you're a shelter on the north side now call somebody on the south side and say hey you got enough you good over here um if you're a food pantry on the north side and, you, and you're doing well then call a food pantry on the west side and say hey you all have enough you good can we connect you to some folks like to be in relationship is what it means to do this neighbor work and i, I think it took us 
maybe uh, through the civil rights era and, and uh, all of these other movements that happened across the 20th century to kind of find out who our neighbor is. Uh, but now like, okay, so let's get to neighboring now, you know, like let's, let's start doing it. Now, you know who your neighbor is, but let's turn that noun into a verb, you know, and, and there are tons of ways that we can do that now, but even afterwards, one thing that I say a lot to congregations and pastors and leaders is, uh, how can you, like, you care about this Black Lives Matter stuff, even if you're a totally white congregation, you care about Black Lives Matter, you, you hate to see folks dying on the streets, who in your community can you be in relationship with? Like, who's being most affected by this? How can you get them a meal, sit down and say, hey, we don't want to take your movement over. You know, like we want you to lead us. We want you to teach us and we want to be trustworthy. And so we want to feed you. We want you to teach us and let's start a relationship together. And it's it's that relationship building that still needs to happen in particular across the stratifications that we have within our society. You know, rich folks talking to poor folks, white and black, what have you. And so if we can do more of that, I think we'll be we'll be closer to kind of living in, in this beloved community that we're all dreaming about. As we've been talking about uh, the work of being neighbor and really turning neighbor into a verb, uh, I wanna share the prayer and meditation that has been keeping me going and the questions that I've been asking about myself and about Chicago as we live through this time. And so, However it is you center yourself to just go ahead and do that, to find, find your place in the world and find a little piece, a piece of peace um, to focus yourself and to connect with, with something that's bigger than all of us. God, we petition you with a question that was once asked of Jesus, who is my neighbor? And we think we know the answer. The answer then was that every child of yours is our neighbor, not only the people who we know or like. You put us in this world to live in community, to live together, to practice life together. And so we thank you for the reminder of who our neighbor is. The real question and the very center of our concern right now, God, is how do we turn neighbor into a verb? How do we go about neighboring in a way that leads to healing, that leads to justice, that leads to reconciliation, and ultimately glorifies you? How do we organize our resources to care for others while still taking care of ourselves? How do we look after ourselves in this time of crisis and not become so selfish that we ignore our neighbors? God, we aren't being philosophical about all of this. Teach us how to remember our actual neighbor, the elderly person that lives above or below us or down the street and next to us, the vulnerable folks who share the building and our workplace and our grass with us. We share this world together. And all of these questions come from our deep desire to live well as neighbors, to push back against the pursuit of personal triumph at the expense of others, to resist with all of our life force the urge to exploit and dominate and manipulate and ignore, to risk ourselves as a revolutionary act of love. Let us be more than neighbors. Now, God, let us go about neighboring. Give us insight to observe and wisdom to interpret and courage to act. Our fear of being hurt, of being denied, of losing too much causes us to cling to ourselves in our vulnerability. Show us your glory. Remind us of the gospel and of the belovedness of all people. Above all, remind us that we live in this life together as we soften our hearts and focus our minds to learn more of what it means to be neighbors. We ask this in your name and in the name of the one who taught us who our neighbor is. And all God's people said, amen.